says, well, your brain is fine. So I thought I just wanted to make sure I passed that on you. No, my brain is fine. I don't know for how much longer, but, but that's part of my job here is to stand up in front of you, not to tell you your brains are fine. I have no idea of that, but to tell you that your souls are fine, that the message of the gospel is that for the sake of Jesus Christ, all is right with our souls in the sight of God. Isn't that a, a blessed thing to be able to know and to hear? Our opening hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, and we'll stand on the last verse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am hardly sorry for them, and sincerely shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto each of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, by your light of grace shining in our hearts and enlightened by the cross of our Savior Jesus Christ, inspire in us a faith that is alive and glorifies you in all we say and do. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 58, verses 3 through 9. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ash under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and to not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 16. And I, when it came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. <clears throat> but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God de decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no comprehend no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that who might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The nat natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understanding the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please rise for the verse and remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated for the hymn.
Let me invite the boys and girls to come up for just a minute. Would you boys and girls like to hear a little story? Come on up here. Oh, I'm so glad to see you this, this morning. A long time ago, like 18 years ago, before any of you were even born, Pastor was in this faraway country called Iraq, and I worked at night, and I would get off of work at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I had to walk a mile to get to the place where I would sleep, and I had to go in the dark because you couldn't have any lights on in that place. And so there were lots of rocks all over the ground, and there were little holes, and if you couldn't see them in the dark, you would stub your toe or you might step in the, a hole, and you couldn't, you're not supposed to have like a regular flashlight. They said you have to have a red light so it doesn't show very far. And so somebody gave me this little tiny light. Look at that. And I could put it on my keychain, and when I would turn it on, it would make just enough little red light so that I could see the rocks. Let's see, let's see it, how that goes. Look at that. 18 years later, it still works. You see that red light, boys and girls? Look at that. And I could just hold it. You can hardly see it in a big bright room like this, but I'd hold it down like this, and it was just enough so I wouldn't step in the rocks. So Jesus tells us that we're like lights for people. We help them so that they can find their way and find their way to Jesus. When you tell people about Jesus, it helps them find their way to him. So you're all just like little lights like this. I'm a big fat light. You guys are little, you guys are little lights, but that's just what people need to find their way. In fact, there's a little song. Moms and dads, you help me sing this song, all right? And watch, you, you do the motions with me, boys and girls. Ready? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no! I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Thank you, boys and girls. Thank you for letting your light shine today. You could go back to your seats. Have a great day. Grace and mercy and peace to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. My text is the gospel text from Matthew chapter 5 out of the Sermon on the Mount today. And as I was reading it, you probably noticed right away, it breaks down into three parts quite easily. And in the first two parts, the subject is you. It's telling you something. In the third part, the subject is Christ who is speaking in the first person. I, I have not come to abolish but to fulfill. So we could break it down in our sermon and look at those three different parts. The first is that you are the salt of the earth. Now, when we think about salt today, the thing that usually comes to our mind first is flavoring. You put salt on your food to give it flavoring. But it's important to realize that that was not the primary purpose back when Jesus was speaking. Salt was used then as a preservative. You would salt meat and things like that so that you slow the decay and you would be able to preserve food longer than you could in a day when they had no refrigeration or such things. And so when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, it's a recognition that this world in which we live is sinful and the terrible consequences of sin are abated by the presence of God's people. The sin, the sin of the world would just keep spiraling downward until God's great judgment would just have to be poured out all around us. But your presence slows down that decay so it doesn't get as bad as it could. You remember the story of Abraham when God announced to him that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they were so wicked? 
And Abraham said, well, Lord, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? If there are 50 righteous people in Sodom, then would you destroy it? God says, no. And then Abraham and God start negotiating, right? Well, what about if there's 45? What if there's 40? Well, what if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? And God says, no, if there's 10 righteous people there, I won't destroy it. Of course, there weren't 10 righteous people because God ended up destroying it. In our confession of sins today, we say that we have justly deserved thy temporal and eternal punishment. Eternal punishment, of course, is those who perish because they refuse to believe that the Son is the one whom the Father has sent into the world to take away our sins. But temporal punishment is talking about present punishment. The punishment that we deserve in our lives here and now. And it's important to realize that God is actually merciful. He does not punish us or judge us for our sins in this life the way that we deserve. I've had people, um, when something really bad happened in their lives, say, why did God let this happen to me? I don't deserve this. Now, this, it would not be appropriate pastorally to tell them this, but theologically, it's important for us all to know it. Thank God he doesn't give us what we deserve in this life, or things would be much, much worse. God is merciful. And this passage lets us know that the presence of Christians actually causes God to hold back on how much judgment he might otherwise bring upon us. We are slowing the decay and holding back the judgment. It's not just our presence, not just the fact that we are here, but he, Jesus says, if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? So there's clearly something that Christians also do which holds back that judgment and slows the decay because it's possible for us not to do that, obviously. What does he mean, salt losing its saltiness? Did you ever have to throw salt away because it stopped being salty before? I, I don't know for a fact this is true, but I heard this a long time ago. It makes a lot of sense that one of the ways they would get salt was from the Dead Sea in those days, which is 10 times saltier than the ocean. Have you ever been to the Dead Sea? You can't drown. You try to go underwater. You keep bobbing up to the top. There's so much salt in it. So they would take the, the wet clay from the edges of the Dead Sea, and they would set it up, and as that clay would dry, then the salt would crystallize on the outside of it, and then you could just brush it off, and you could use that salt. But at some point, after all the salt is crystallized, and you've brushed it all off, what you just have a lump of clay. So you throw it out into the, the street. It has lost its saltiness. And so we could lose our saltiness. So what are we having to have to do to stay salty? We should model by our own lives the way people should live. By our prayers and intercessions, we should be asking God to protect and preserve our family from sin, preserve and protect our community from sin, preserve and protect our nation from sin, and we should use our voices to try to help our society structure its laws so that we do in our society what is righteous. And you will have plenty of opportunities in your lives to help people put the brakes on their slide into sin, and that's being salt of the earth. You don't have to be a jerk about it, right? We don't have to be holier than thou. It's not as if I don't have sins. But we can certainly be winsome and speak up if we see things sliding the wrong way. When I was in the Navy, one of the things that happens, unfortunately, is the language just decays very quickly. And even righteous people, they're around it so much without thinking about it. They say words that they would never say at home. And so I knew some really good Christian people that would have like a little jar on their desk and it was the cuss jar. <laughs> and so if you went in that guy's office and you accidentally said a cuss word, you had to put a quarter in the jar. And just by doing that, it made people stop long enough to think about what they were saying. And so it would slow the decay, and it would take away some of the terrible language that was happening, right? Even here in the church, we don't have a cuss jar, because I don't hear much cussing in the church. But in our church, like most churches, the thing we have to think about a lot of times is breaking the Eighth Commandment. I'm prone to do this too. You start talking to someone, and the next thing you know, you're talking about someone else in the church, and now it's where, where the Lord says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And Luther says, what does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not lie about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain his actions in the kindest way. But all of a sudden, now we're not explaining each other's actions in the kindest way. We're talking about how bad that person is or what they, what they did. So it, it's 
part of our responsibility as salt of the earth to step in and say, oh, let's think positively about that situation. Let's put the most charitable construction on what's going on there. Now, not only are we the salt of the earth, but we're also the light of the world. Salt has a negative function, right? The salt slows the decay. But the light is a positive function. The light is to illuminate God's truth and God's word. We are to give that light to others. We're to bear witness to others about what God has done in Jesus Christ. When you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know that the, the Lord has come to redeem us from sin. And that becomes the template for your thinking. You should never, as a Christian, ever forget for even a second that every person you meet, every person with whom you interact, the most important thing about them is that they will be judged eternally on whether they believe in Jesus or do not believe in Jesus. Nothing is more important than that. Jesus said in John 3, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so everything hinges on this for every person. Do they come to the light or not come to the light? What, what is coming to the light? Well, Jesus, just a few verses earlier in John, said it this way. Whoever believes in him, meaning whoever believes in the Son of God, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Ah, it's believing in Jesus. Not just believing that he exists. James tells us the devil believes that he exists. That's nothing. It's believing him in the sense of trusting him. Trusting that he has taken our sins away. Trusting that he is God's provision for me to escape eternal condemnation and instead receive eternal life. That is big. And that should occupy our thinking as Christians all the time. But how will people know to believe in this light, to believe in Jesus, if the light is not shown to them? How will they know about Jesus and who he is and what he has done if we don't bear witness to it and shine that light forth to those who are in darkness? When Jesus says in our Matthew text, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, it's important that we think about that carefully because a lot of times people take that to mean do all kinds of good works before men, and that's how they'll know about Jesus. But he clearly can't be talking about that because it's in the same sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, when you give to the needy, do it in secret. When you pray, pray in your closet so no one sees you. When you fast, do it in secret. So which is it? Should we do our good works in secret so no one sees them? Or are we supposed to do our good works in front of everybody so that everyone sees them? Well, the answer is that he, it's qualified. The good works that you're supposed to do before others are the good works that have to do with showing forth the light. You're not trying to show other people what a great person you are, but you are trying to show people the message of what Jesus Christ has done for them. That's the light that we shine. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So it's not all of your good works. It's the good works that can cause them to glorify God because they too then can believe in Jesus Christ. So just like being the salt of the earth, we don't have to be obnoxious about it, right? We can do it winsomely, we can do it graciously, we can do it humbly but with confidence. But it's a matter of looking for those opportunities where the Lord opens a door and we might be able to talk to someone else about Jesus or say something. You can talk with Jesus about Jesus with your grandkids. You can talk about Jesus with your buddies on the football team. You can talk about Jesus with the person that works at the desk desk next to you. But it's a matter of speaking about Jesus when the Lord gives us that chance, right? First Peter says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So always being prepared is the key to letting that light shine. I read an interesting article about a pastor. He's a, he's a big film aficionado. And so he has an atheist friend. They don't see eye to eye on the faith, 
but she also likes films. And so she came to him apparently one day and she said, hey, did you see the movie The Guardians of the Galaxy? How did you like that? How many of you have seen The Guardians of the Galaxy? S some of you, okay. So the, the pastor starts to explain to her, did you know there's like a Christ figure in The Guardians of the Galaxy? And how is this atheist woman? I mean, what? What are you talking about? Well, there's Groot who keeps saying, I am Groot. I am. And he's, so it's just like Jesus and all the times in the Bible where Jesus says, I am, and it explains who he is. And then at the end of the movie, Groot dies, but then he returns to life, just like Jesus who dies. And the atheist woman is listening. <laughs> she's, what, a, what a clever way for that pastor to tie in something that she's interested in and be able to use it to point toward Jesus and talk about Jesus with her. So we need to look for those opportunities. Don't be so concerned about what you're going to say or if you'll say it right. Be more concerned about will you grab the chance rather than say nothing. Now the first two sections of our text had to do with you. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. But the last section then, the subject is Jesus. We don't have as much time here on this, but we need to note that Jesus says he has come not to abolish the law and the prophets. In other words, all the things that God has revealed before him, Jesus didn't come to say, okay, forget that. I'm starting something all new. But he came to fulfill them. It's not an abrogation of what was in there. There's nothing in our Bible that is all of a sudden done away with. It's rather that those things are fulfilled. For example, at Christmas this year, my youngest daughter was staying with us, and so she made uh, some, some crab dip with crab meat in it, and she's eating the crab. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, you couldn't eat crab. Crab was not kosher. You're not supposed to eat. So why can we eat it now? But they couldn't eat it then. How come the Bible applies in the old days to that, but it doesn't apply to us? Well, because the Bible has made it clear that the kosher laws were to teach us and show us the difference between what was clean and unclean. But now that Jesus Christ has come and he has made us spiritually clean, and now that all people, even the Gentiles who once were unclean, are now part of his kingdom, that those, that law is fulfilled. It's not done away with, it's fulfilled today. And so Jesus says everything is going to be fulfilled in him. Every iota, as I read in the ESV text there, we think that that's talking about the Hebrew letter yod. It's just this little tiny letter that appears um, in, in the tops of the words. He says every dot. In the King James Version, you're probably familiar with this. Remember it said, every jot and tittle. What's a tittle? <laughs> We're not entirely sure. But some think, I'll see if I can do this backwards for you. There are two, uh, two Hebrew words, um, or two, excuse me, two Hebrew letters. The letter dalet is a, a horizontal line like this. And then just inside the end of that line, then there's a, a vertical line. And the Hebrew letter resh is a line that goes over and then goes straight down. So what's the difference between those two letters? It's just that little itty bitty piece that, that hangs over. That might be the tittle, right? The, the, the little horn, they call it sometimes. But that's the difference between one letter and another letter. It makes all the difference in the world. So every little thing, Jesus is saying, every little thing in the scripture is important and it's going to be kept and none of it's going to be done away with. And so how is that done? It's done through him. He's the one who keeps the Old Testament perfectly. All of the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in him. All of its teleology is pointing toward him. All of its purposes come to pass in him. And so Jesus says to us, your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now remember, the scribes and Pharisees were people who spent full time learning and 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 having their lives flow out of all of the laws. So if you're not spending full time studying God's word, all your time devoted to it, guess what? You're out. <laughs> Forget it. You don't exceed it. But fortunately, someone did exceed it. That was Jesus. And so Jesus is the one who gives you the ticket. Jesus is the one who makes sure that you are in. Do you know why you are the salt of the earth? Do you know why you are the light of the world? Because you have a Savior who has made you thus. You have a Savior who is everything and who has fulfilled everything in God and the one on whom God has put his stamp of approval. And for his sake, that's what makes you important and special. Amen.
Would you please rise and join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer. O Lord our God, we come before you, and we recognize that in Jesus Christ you have cut loose the bonds of sin in our lives, and you have released the straps of the heavy yoke that weighed us down, and you have set us free. Grant us, O Lord, to live like free people. Help us gladly to receive every day anew your great blessings that you grant us in Christ. We thank you, O Lord, that you have delivered us from the cruel oppression of the evil one, and we pray that you would grant us also now thankful hearts so that we can rejoice. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for this holy and precious life-giving word that will endure until all is accomplished. For your word, Lord, stems right from your very own heart. It is your own thoughts. Well, the, the things that you have communicated to us that bring life into our souls. So we pray that you would help pastors everywhere to declare your word faithfully. We pray that you would put within us a yearning and a hunger that we would long for more of your word, to study it, to, to discuss it, to memorize it, to look at it more than a little newborn baby longs for milk. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our families, Lord, and we ask that you would give wisdom and courage to parents in the very challenging tasks of raising children. And we ask that you would make our homes, O oh Lord, havens of peace, that you would take away quarreling, that you would take away self-service and ambition, and that you would grant instead that your son's love for us would be the model for how we would love one another. We pray, O oh Lord, that your angels would guard over our homes and make them oases of righteousness and goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray that you would protect us from temptation, from falling into the lures of the devil, that our lives would not stray downward, but rather that we would be drawn always toward your righteousness. And grant us, O oh Lord, then to be salt in this earth, that the people who see us and know us, the people who are the recipients of our prayers, the people who observe our lives, that they too will be drawn away from wickedness and toward what is right in your, your eyes. Grant us the light, O oh Lord. Grant us powerful testimonies of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray, O oh Lord, that even as your son did miraculous signs and wonders as he walked upon the earth, and we believe that you still do miraculous things in our day, we pray and come to you knowing that you care deeply for us in our earthly needs. And we have many, O oh Lord, that we know or extended members of our families or friends who are in deep need. And so we want to pray, O oh Lord, for our shut-ins, for Pearl and Carol and for uh, Kathy, who has been hospitalized part of this last week. For those battling cancer, Lord, Doris and Don. For Lynn and Marilyn. For Sarah. For those with various other health concerns, O oh Lord, that we place before you. For Ron and Chuck. For Arlene and Lena. Amanda. For Wayne. For continued recovery for Dick for Dave's sister, Debbie, with a broken hip, for Janice and for Donna, for Ed and Gary, Mario, and for Marv, and all others that we name to you in our hearts. Also, Lord, we lift before you the family of 
Diane Gartner and all of her friends and all those who feel the emptiness in their lives after she has been called home. And while she is with you rejoicing, be for us then our consolation and reassurance that we shall see her again in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your glory, we pray that it would rest around us, that you would hear our pleas and our intercessions, that you would grant us every good and precious gift that we need, that you would pour forth the Holy Spirit abundantly on our lives, and that worthily through faith, a deep and abiding faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, we might live our lives and know the triumph of one day seeing you face to face. This we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We will now receive your offerings. Would you please rise as we continue with our service of Holy Communion? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. And it, is right to give and it is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who came that the light of your salvation might shine through his cross to the whole world in order that whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Mm -hmm. Claim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses 
table of the Lord. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Let us pray. Thanks and praise be to you, Almighty God, for in your Son's very body and blood you have increased in us the gracious light of saving faith. Help us that this saving light may shine through us in our world in all that we say and do through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Let's be seated for the closing.
to worship with you today. And those of you that are joining us on the live stream, welcome. Uh, just a, some quick announcements here. Um, I, I hate changing the schedule. I always hate it because it's not fair to people and someone will fall through the cracks, but I, I had to make a change in the schedule. So since I was sick this last week and we didn't finish our Wednesday night Bible study series, I'm going to postpone family movie night this coming Wednesday. We'll do that after Easter sometime. So this coming Wednesday, instead of family movie night, we'll have our final um, Bible study series on Wednesday night on the Bible. And we'll also still have confirmation then this, this Wednesday night. So I apologize for, for doing that to you, making that change. Also, please uh, take note on your calendar that the... Um, the visitation for Diane Gardner will be here at Hope Lutheran on Friday, starting at 3 o'clock, and the funeral at 5.30, followed by dinner downstairs. That's on Friday. Um, we also have uh, Sunday school this morning, so if the kids want to gather by the piano for our opening at 20 after 10, and then we'll, we'll go downstairs, and there will be adult Sunday school also in the fellowship room. Are there any other announcements that I'm forgetting? There is a sign-up sheet for Trivia Night on February 24th. Um, we need to get a head count so we can reserve tables down there. So sign up if you're interested or ask me for more information. Thank you. Be, yeah. Is bowling tonight at 5 o'clock? How many of you in Bullington? Bow bowling tonight at 5 o'clock. Anything else? Gail. Is the Midwest? Yes, they are. Midwest Creation Fellowship tomorrow night at Beautiful Savior in Antioch. That starts at 7. Thank you. Then go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.